comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there, full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, gold and commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the U.S. dollar collapses and U.S. assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX, a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, Adaptive Asset Allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let Adaptive Asset Allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit RationalMF.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund. All right. All right. Welcome, Welcome Victor. Victor. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I guess before we begin, since Mike isn't on the call, I'll, uh, I'll do the honors. Uh, nothing you guys hear on the show today should be construed as investment advice. This uh, conversation is for entertainment and, well, hopefully entertainment, but definitely informational purposes. So with that being said, welcome again, Victor. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks uh, for... I guess. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it would be uh, helpful for the people that might not be familiar with your work to get a bit of your background before we jump in on so many of the themes that we've been uh, talking uh, offline that we want to discuss. Okay. Uh, well, just very quickly, um, I've been a financial analyst um, and strategist for about 40 years uh, in Australia, Asia Pacific, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, US, Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, I covered a variety of sectors. I covered a variety of styles. Uh, currently, I am at Macquarie uh, in New York uh, doing global uh, and Asia-Pacific strategy. I'm also um, a writer. I, I published a, a book uh, called, uh, you know, Three Empires, uh, Four Turning Points and the Future of Humanity, very humble title. Uh, but essentially what it does, uh, it, uh, it kind of looks back at the last 500 years uh, and ask what actually was successful, what worked. Uh, and then look forward. Uh, what's going to happen over the next two or three decades? Is the world changing? Is a success formula changing? And perhaps more importantly, uh, because I've been based in China, Hong Kong, on and off for 24 years, uh, the question is whether we do need to be free. Do we need to be free at all? Uh, or is a linkage between freedom uh, and independence is broken? the linkage between that and being successful and being profitable and being innovative uh, and being prosperous. Do we need to be free to be prosperous? Uh, and that's essentially the essence of the book. Um, basically saying over the last 500 years, the answer is yes, you must be free. If you're not free, uh, unfortunately, you're going to fall by the wayside. Uh, but is it still true uh, if we go over the next 20 or 30 years? So yeah. that's very quickly me. That's that's a great intro and that's a great summary of what we're going to discuss uh, for the rest of the call today. Before we were we went online, uh, it piqued my interest to get just a little bit of uh, like a story, a personal story about your background in uh, in Hong Kong. And you were saying you got there early. Um, you you saw the changeover in '94 and then back again recently. I'd be curious just to hear some of that before we get into the nitty gritty of the of the book. No, absolutely. I, um, I moved uh, from Australia to Hong Kong in 1994. So for about three years, I saw the British Hong Kong, the colonial Hong Kong. Uh, I still remember 1st of July, 1997. It was a very rainy day uh, when the British flag came down and the Chinese flag came up. 
Um, I was there all the way to 2000, 2001, and then it came back again in 2010. And I was there for the last 11 years. So I saw how Hong Kong changed over time, uh, particularly in the last two or three years. And when a lot of people say um, Hong Kong has finished, uh, Hong Kong is gone. Look, Victor, you left. Many other people are leaving. Um, I don't think it's fair to say Hong Kong has finished. Hong Kong is changing and will change dramatically and will continue to change dramatically. It's not going to be a window to the world. It's going to be a much more China-centric center. Um, and it will have different people and it will have different businesses and it will have different functions. So Hong Kong is not finished, but Hong Kong, as we all knew uh, over the last 20, 25 years, is now lo no longer there. Um, and it's changing. Some people are hoping and a lot of people are hoping for the best. Um, and I think Hong Kong will continue to be very critical uh, for China as you go forward, but not in the same function as it was in the past. Yeah, it's a it's a, almost a good metaphor for um, the change that you describe as um, almost inevitable for you know, the rest of the world, maybe like one path that we may follow over the next few decades. Um, and so I'm wondering whether your time in Hong Kong and the observation and experience of this transition, um, was that one of the motivating factors for you to want to write this book and to write it now? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it was. Because uh, if you think of uh, the new China, so to speak, since 2012, uh, when Xi Jinping came to power, uh, it was clear that all the all the things we've seen between call it 1995 and 2008 are likely to go into reverse. Uh, whether it's deregulatory drive, whether it's liberalization drive, whether it's a role of the state, both in allocating capital, directing capital, uh, the role of the state on enterprises, uh, the sort of shrinkage of the space between the private sector and the public sector, fusion of public and private, it was clear that that trend is unstoppable. Uh, so it's not something, anything new. It was clear for at least 10 years. And so the question then becomes, uh, in a modern world <clears throat> where the role of humans is different, the role of capital is different, the role of money is different, uh, in that world, um, as I said, is it OK not to have as much private space uh, as we enjoyed in the past? Is it okay not to have the same degree of freedom? Uh, and I think what China is trying to prove, um, and, and they might be able to prove it over the next decade, uh, that that sort of a free space doesn't have to be as free. Uh, but the other interesting thing, the West is going through exactly the same process. Because if you think about it, the problems confronting China are not dissimilar what Joe Biden is looking at. Common prosperity is pretty similar theme in the United States as well, which is essentially um, um, is affordable housing a human right? Is access to broadband a human right? Uh, is affordable health care or education uh, a human right, not a business? Uh, and so China is trying to tackle it, but in many ways, Joe Biden was without the same tools or the same ability to bend society and economy to, to his will, also is trying to address. Pretty much the same applies to uh, digital platforms. What is the role of digital platforms in our society? Um, should you be allowing digital platforms to control real economy or should real economy be more important uh, than a digital economy? Again, uh, China is approaching it in a very direct fashion because most of the decisions are abrupt. They are unappealable uh, in any form or shape uh, and they can be implemented incredibly fast. Uh, in the West, you can't do that, but we're still debating what is the role of digital uh, platforms. Uh, the same applies to surveillance and surveillance systems. The same applies to what is considered to be right or not right, whether you are writing it, whether you're discussing it. So, so to me, uh, it's, it's interesting that the West clearly is also moving. Uh, it is becoming less free. Uh, if you think of the role of the government, now, in China, People's Bank of China has never been independent. Commercial banks have never been commercial. And private sector was never really truly private. Uh, now, if you think of the West, we're now debating what is the role of Federal Reserve? What is the role of ECB? 
extent to which they need to coordinate with the treasury departments or finance departments. We're debating what to do with banks. Should we ring fence them? Should we do something else with the banking sector? And now we're also debating what to do with the private sector, uh, extent to which other policies should be impinging or directing private sector to do things. So again, uh, very similar issues. Uh, it's just the approach is different. Yeah. How does one, this relate? One, one dynamic that I, um, and, and, and I studied this quite a bit in the knots, and it's since sort of um, been sidelined a little bit, but this idea that for 18 of the past 20 centuries, China was the dominant global um, economy. And, you know, then there was a time at which the West overtook them. And, and you spent quite a long uh, sort of the first section of your book is entirely devoted to the qualities of sort of a Western orientation that allowed for the West to come to dominate uh, over the other major global um, communities or societies that existed through history, mainly the uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Ottomans. And so I'd love for maybe just to set the table. I actually want to spend most of the conversation looking at the contemporary situation and, and looking forward. But I think it's important to set the table first with what happened over that sort of five centuries from, say, the 15th century to the 20th century that allowed the West to come to so completely dominate the other uh, potential global superpowers? Well, there are a lot of books on that subject, of course, but uh, one, one of the things, one of the things I, uh, is important to understand uh, that the West was in many ways a lucky beneficiary of the collapse of the Roman Empire. Uh, it bequested the West with certain tools, uh, whether it's a canon law, uh, whether it's uh, we should turn transferred into civil law and a contractual law, whether it was division into small dioceses, which used to be provinces of Roman Empire, which in turn evolved into various states uh, that could never quite dominate each other. It never really get to the stage that one of those little pieces managed to dominate. And so there was a great deal of competition uh, for ideas, for wealth, for money, uh, for technology, um, and all of that competition led to gradual opening up. And what the book is discussing, there were certain turning points. Uh, one of the turning points clearly were the Mongols. Mongols unquestionably in the 13th century reshaped completely China, Middle East, uh, what is uh, effectively Turkey now. Uh, Russia essentially is the successor state uh, of the Mongol Empire. They never really gone beyond Poland and Hungary. They, they did defeat Polish and Hungarian kings, uh, but they never really gone beyond that. Uh, and so you can argue that the West was spared, uh, not just destructions that Mongols have brought about, but also types of institutions and habits uh, that Mongols brought with them. Uh, and so, so that was the first major turning point. Uh, it would be interesting to see what Europe would have looked like if Mongols did go uh, beyond Poland and Hungary. Uh, the second one clearly was the Black Death. Uh, if you think of different places around the world, uh, Europe just had a little bit more of urbanization uh, in the 14th century. Uh, as I said, the, prince, uh, the princes, the royalties were somewhat less powerful. The guilds were developing. So you find some of the artisans were a little bit more powerful. And so when population was decimated uh, across the entire Eurasia, in Russia, it created serfdom. Uh, in Russia, you, you need to pin down people because land was a lot less valuable than few individuals uh, that were actually residing on that land. Uh, but in the West, it actually created an open labor market whereby where your guilds or where your town people or, or your landowners, you were competing for labor. So that was your second major point. And the third one leading into is, is Renaissance uh, and basically rediscovery uh, of the ancients. Uh, and, and to me, those three things created a much more flexible economies, much more flexible societies. Uh, and whenever you have more flexible societies, that means the periods of contraction tend to be shallower uh, and a period of growth tends to be faster. Now, to begin with, it doesn't make much difference. But when you go century after century, it all accumulates. 
Uh, and as most visitors back even um, in the 18th century already saw that both Ottomans uh, as, well as, uh, as well as the Chinese were falling further and further behind. Uh, so it wasn't just it happened right now, it was happening over centuries. Uh, but by early 19th century, really, the gap was uh, completely unbridgeable. So the secret source or the secret formula uh, of the West was really as that degree of freedom, freedom to explore, freedom to ask questions, freedom to build on the shoulders of previous generations, rather than having to reinvent stuff all over again every time. Uh, that sort of freedom did not exist in China, Russia, or the Ottomans. Uh, and what it enabled it to do is that in the West, the law predated creation of states. Uh, in China and Russia, states predated law. So law never had the primacy uh, in either China, and even today it doesn't, in either China, Russia, or, or Turkey, uh, the way it had been in the West. So it's really the benefit of collapse of Roman Empire, the splintering of dioceses and states, uh, the canon law uh, and the primacy of civil law and other contractual laws uh, that, that really created a sort of a petri dish from which the West arose. And then you needed just to have a couple of turning points, a couple of critical junctions, which just accelerated the whole process uh, a lot. So apart from the legacy of the Roman Empire and the this institutional backdrop that was built and that was compounded over time, what role do you think geography played? Because th there's been a lot of work uh, by Jared Diamond and Guns, yeah. and Seal and other works that talk about how this geog geographical benefit for arable land and, and temperate climate and all these, these variables that allowed uh, sedentary work to 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 be uh, created after the phase of hunter gathering and subsistence. So I wonder if you might speak a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think Jared Diamond's sort of long term view is absolutely correct. That Eurasia, uh, and if you decide more like a fertile crescent, which is mostly Turkey, Iran, uh, Middle East, uh, had advantages that other areas didn't have, whether it was grass, whether it was, you know, four key species of animals like goats and cows and horses, uh, whatever it was, that other, other regions didn't have that. And at the same time, Eurasia is very sort of uh, east to west. So it's easier to propagate it whenever you have, compared to very narrow channels like North America to South America or Africa. So you could see how it could propagate uh, both the species, the agriculture, how it was easier to propagate uh, uh, literature, uh, word of mouth or anything else across Eurasia. And so longer term, he's absolutely right. Uh, the problem is when you start splitting it up a little bit and say, okay, I understand that, but why is uh, Northwest Europe, which was not part of any of that, today is much wealthier than Turkey uh, or Egypt or Iraq? Uh, you can also debate the extent to which geography played a role in other places. Uh, so, for example, you could argue uh, maybe landlocked, landlocked countries uh, can't really develop very well because there are huge transportation costs. They don't interact as well. But, you know, what about Switzerland? Uh, what about Botswana? Uh, what about Chile? Not landlocked, but the terrible geography. Uh, what about those countries? The same applies to sort of cocktail of diseases as well, uh, that people will say, well, it's much harder to do it around tropical climate or equatorial climate. Um, well, uh, look at Singapore, look at Malaysia, look at Dubai. Uh, so, so, so to me, I, I think geography does play a part. Um, I think uh, climatic conditions uh, and the cocktail of diseases also plays a part. Uh, but to me, they're not the primary drivers. Uh, I, I do think that the primary drivers are institutional, they're cultural. Uh, one could debate the extent to which it becomes eventually genetic. Uh, and that's a completely total set of discussion. Uh, but but to me, to me, that seemed to be much more powerful than, you know, blaming geography or climate or, or something else. Yeah, well, I think you, you would have to agree that there is an, an interplay, right? I mean, certainly the fact that Northern Europeans extended their occupation into North America and therefore had access to a massive land and resource surplus in the presence of relatively scarce labor to develop that capital base 
was right. a pretty substantial advantage. And then, of course, having North America um, isolated on both sides and therefore not nearly as susceptible to incursion. Um, but you could say the same thing, I think, also about Russia and China in terms of land Correct. and resource surplus. So Correct. it wasn't Correct. exclusively land and resource surplus. You needed to combine land and resource surplus with with labor scarcity and sort of a Western oriented value system and dynamism and in institutions in order to facilitate that, make the most of the, um, that, that excess capital base. Absolutely. And also you're Absolutely. looking at Mexico and South America, like Mexico and the United States, incredibly close. You, you saw lots of land, lots of opportunities, but I remember reading a history book back in the day that showed that the, the way that they lured um, Europeans to North America was one of, this is a beautiful place, artists come, Jesuits come, we'll, we'll bring you in with open arms, you can create your own future, blah, blah, blah. The Spaniards, my people, the Peruvians, and a little bit of the Portuguese for Richard was Brazilian, uh, were lured by gold. And the type of people that came is like, they, I will back you up, you will be part of the military, you can rape and pillage take the gold, bring it back. And if you decide to stay, you will be given a, a plot of land that you will rule over. So yeah, a extraction. very, very different Versus, cultural and, yeah. and backing as to what, what type of people we attracted. And Correct. a lot of that, I think, the Caudillo culture in South America is what continues to plague us today in contrast to the United States and Canada. Correct. Correct. I mean, you can compare Hong Kong and Macau, for example. Uh, one was a British settlement. The other one was a Portuguese uh, settlement. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. It, it's, a, it's a culture. It's institutional settings. Uh, just promulgating or, or declaring a constitution and saying our constitution is the same as the United States uh, means absolutely nothing. Uh, because at the end of the day, societal norms are very, very different. And if they are different, you can proclaim whatever constitution you want. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not going to function. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing, United States is one of the very few democracies that managed to maintain a presidential system. Uh, usually presidential systems are susceptible uh, to coups. They're susceptible uh, to sort of garnering all of the power in the hands of one person. That's why almost all democracies have more Westminster uh, parliamentary system uh, rather than uh, rather than presidential system. So the interesting thing, U.S. actually somehow uh, over the last couple of hundred years uh, managed uh, to keep a presidential system and at the same time uh, keep democracy. But but what you're discussing is absolutely right. Uh, yes, climate has some impact. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you know the. Um, uh, climate, geography, uh, ability to communicate across mountains, all of that has some impact. Uh, but at the end of the day, what those things do is accelerate or, or de-accelerate pre-existing conditions, pre-existing structures. I, I mean, one of the things my book is highlighting, China clearly was ahead of anybody uh, back in 1300s. China was at the doorstep of industrial revolution. They had everything from moving print back way before Gutenberg. Uh, they had uh, they had they had everything. They had paper. Uh, they they could have gone into pretty much any area, um, and they didn't. Uh, and, and and so the question is why they didn't they do it? Their coal mines had almost modern equipment. I mean, something that Europeans didn't get until 19th century, uh, and that was 12 and 1300s. Uh, but it didn't happen. <clears throat> the same applies with Russia. Uh, Russia had tremendous iron ore resources in Ural Mountains. There was no coal, but there was plenty of charcoal uh, you could have used. Uh, and then, of course, they had a coal and iron ore in Ukraine. Uh, and, and, and somehow, either they're always too late or were too late, or alternative, they never quite got there. Um, and so, to me, the institutional sort of reasons or cultural reasons are really so dominant that everything else can be overcome, I think. Yeah, I think it makes sense that the driving force would be the cultural and institutional backdrop, but the geographical advantages would allow those to compound. And so That's it's right. what Adam was saying, that interplay right. is what allow that, that, that symbiosis between uh, nature and then nurture to, to then create these societies. And, and to your point about the U.S., I think, it has to do with the checks and balances that the, the founding fathers created and the power of the Congress 
is second to none in presidential assistance. I think the, the U.S. Congress has a lot more teeth than other uh, countries with presidential assistance. But, but you have to remember that if you think of Latin America in the 19th century, they pretty much adopted the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so what we see today uh, in Latin America is just changes that occurred because societal norms were not in tune uh, with the way constitution was supposed to function. But to begin with, the differences actually were not that significant. Constitutions were almost the same. Yeah, we just have 120,000 amendments versus right. whatever right. the 40 that exist in the U.S. Uh, in in two right. years before right. we create a new constitution. That's right. So the, the, the dominant driver of prosperity over the last couple of hundred years under a paradigm of freedom, uh, liberalization, um, rule of law, property rights, et cetera, the, the institutional framework that allowed the West to, to rise to dominance, predominantly that rose or that occurred over a period of industrialization, industrialization um, was the the primary wealth driver and was what allowed the, the West to come um, to dominance. But it wasn't a smooth ride. And, and this was an interesting part of what um, I really uh, liked about the intro or the first part of your book, right? It's highlighting the dislocations and disequilibria that occurred as we were industrializing and as you know there were these lost decades for for several generations that just never benefited from the these new technologies right mm -hmm. and and i think that this lays sets the table for how we might think about the information age and how it's different mm -hmm. than the industrial age but maybe talk a little bit about the early industrial age um marx and what was happening when he was doing his best thinking and his best writing, and then what came later, and then when when the movement of industrialization sort of crested, and then we'll sort of get into what happened, what happened after. Yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. It's not a straight uh, a straight line, uh, and there were many hiccups and many problems along the way, um, and. It's not surprising that Karl Marx penned his uh, Communist Manifesto in 1848, uh, which was really the peak uh, of disruption of the first Industrial Revolution, and as you were going into the second Industrial Revolution. Uh, essentially, everything around you was changing. Uh, suddenly, you know, peasants didn't know who the Lord of the Manor was anymore. Um, suddenly, craftsmen, who were very proud of the job they were doing, saw factories growing all, all around them. And they had a choice of either you're unemployed or you join the factory or somehow find a niche uh, that you can be uh, useful at. Uh, and the same applies to aristocracy. Suddenly they found that they no longer have the same social position uh, as they used to enjoy in the past. And that social position always came with responsibilities. It's not just you were the lord of the manor. There were certain responsibilities uh, that you were obliged to have. Uh, and, and so all of that's become incredibly disruptive. Uh, and and so when Luddites, you know, were smashing looms, uh, they were smashing looms not because they thought, oh, my goodness, they're going to take our jobs. They were smashing looms because they understood that that will denigrate uh, their pride, their job, ultimately their freedom, ultimately their compensation and everything else. And they were totally and completely correct. Now, a lot of people say, hey, uh, it's all ended up OK. Uh, and I, one of the things I describe in the book, if you've just gone into the time machine and you've gone into early 1800 London and you were to tell Luddites, please don't smash anything. Believe me, in 30 or 40 years, it's all going to be OK. Uh, they will smash your head because they, they, the 30, 40 years was basically their entire life. Um, and it is true. Productivity start to improve. If you, as you go into the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, uh, productivity started to improve. Real wages started to rise. Um, and Marx was right at the back end of the first Industrial Revolution. He didn't live long enough to see disruption uh, of the second Industrial Revolution. But then that came along, uh, and the second Industrial Revolution had a much bigger waterfront, because the first Industrial Revolution is basically cotton, steam, <clears throat> railways. <clears throat> if you think of the second Industrial Revolution, 
chemical, pharmaceutical industry, combustion engine, uh, electricity, refrigeration, much, much wider waterfront. Uh, and again, you had dislocations. Uh, remember, what we discussed as terrorists, uh, that's back in 1870s, 1880s, they were bombing coffee shops, they were killing the Tsar of Russia, <clears throat> they were killing later on the President of the United States. Uh, and so again, um, it was another set of dislocation that occurred. Um, and you could argue that the long war, which is the first and the second world war was a back end uh, of that dislocation of the second industrial age. Um, but Keynes between... had a lot to say about, about what was going on during that period. You know, as the first industrial age had, had sort of passed, we were now in the beginning of the second industrial age. That's when, when, Keynes was penning yes. his missives about what, what to expect. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and Keynes, one of the things he was describing, <clears throat> what will happen if this continues? Uh, and if this continues, his view was in four generations, we will have nothing to do. Uh, in a sense, productivity eventually is going to be so high uh, <clears throat> that basically it will be liberated uh, from the slavery of labor. And so the way I look at it, whether it was 1850s when Karl Marx was debating something very similar, because to Karl Marx, the idea of communism was not a totalitarian system, but rather a system of such a high productivity uh, that basically you're liberated. You can do whatever you think is appropriate from everyone according to his ability to everyone according to his needs. Um, and if you think of Keynes uh, in 1930, uh, it's pretty much exactly the same idea. <clears throat> if you think of 1980s, 90s, a lot of people, including people like Peter Drucker, were debating very similar issue. What will happen if technology continues to move forward? As it continues to move forward, yes, there are disruptions. Yes, there are 40, 50, maybe 100 years uh, of volatility. But at the end of that process, productivity, which used to be 10 bips for a thousand years, which then rose to 100 bips after the first industrial revolution, then rose to 200 bips after second. Now we're back down to below 100 bips in most places. That could mushroom to 500 bips, 600 bips, or maybe more. Uh, and if it does, at that point in time, uh, there is a sort of liberation of labor uh, that is going to occur. Uh, and so that's what we are facing. But, but the thing is, so, so there is a glorious outcome at the end of it. There is a glorious good thing at the end of that. But between here and now and that final destination uh, lies pretty treacherous times, just like it was in the Karl Marx days. Uh, the way I look at it, when he was describing, you know, lumpen proletariat, which is proletariat that lost his, his or her consciousness. They don't know what they are anymore. When he was describing bourgeoisie that was complete an aristocracy, that was completely disoriented. Uh, you can step back and say, well, it's exactly the same thing. They had factories, we have artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, they used to have, uh, they used to have, you know, aristocracy, we have our own aristocracy. And so, and so it's exactly the same disintermediation, the same discontinuities. Uh, and, and the thing is that the, the interesting thing to me was uh, that uh, the next 20 or 30 years will, in my view, will be the peak of that disruption. Isn't it amazing how <clears throat> all of these thoughts and philosophies and books have been completely uh, been given one camp of you're a bad book, you're a bad philosophy, and you're a good philosophy. You know, Karl Marx, Communist Manifesto, then you have uh, uh, Keynes and others talking about similar things, but from a different context. And yet it's all leading. It, it was just a mismatch of timing, right? It was about if the, there's going to be a few organizations that are going to make all the wealth, we have to help the proletariat gain some of that wealth, get redistribution, have a social safety net. You know, all of the, these things that today are the real things that we have for a capitalist economy are actually Marxist ideas yes. in many respects. <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, you can trace it even before Marx. But, <clears throat> but yes, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, it's, it's a similar issues. Whenever you go through those periods of dislocation, you find, let, let's say you have a first industrial revolution. The billionaires of the first industrial revolution were cotton manufacturers, were textile manufacturers. Uh, if you think of the second industrial revolution, uh, that was your Henry Ford. <laughs> uh, it, it's a, uh, if you think of today, 
this is your IT biotech. Uh, and so whenever you go through those, through those junctions, uh, a small number of people become incredibly productive. Uh, and a small part of the economy becomes incredibly productive. And so compensation levels, whether it's in capital or wages, goes up massively. Uh, but the rest of the economy is sort of killed one cut at a time. And that's why aggregate productivity cannot really increase until such time as everybody, more or less, is on the same page. But that takes decades. Uh, on average, through the first and indi second industrial revolution, you're looking 50, 70 years. That takes at least two generations, sometimes longer, for everybody to get on the same page. And then what you have, you have a lift. Um, but as I said, in between, you have sort of uh, a problem of churning waters. You have a problem of wealth inequalities. You have to remember that British wealth inequality, which was extreme in 1830s, 40s, did not correct itself until 1910s. Uh, now, sometimes you can argue that those sorts of corrections require a war. In other words, this physical destruction uh, of capital and labor. Uh, and that is true. But there are other ways of doing it. I mean, uh, Iron Chancellor Bismarck, uh, who was not uh, a communist by any stretch, uh, he was the first one to introduce social welfare system and unemployment benefits. Uh, and in 1880s, the argument was that will undermine the common uh, capitalism, that will undermine uh, the development of Germany. It didn't. It just took the sting out of what otherwise would have been a much more volatile uh, period for Germany. So let's... Let's sort of move forward in time a little bit. So we, we've we crossed over the um, point of maximum acceleration of the second industrial rev re uh, revolution. Productivity has begun to attenuate again. Um, does that set us up for a discussion of what happened when they, when Nixon closed the gold window, the abandoned Bretton Woods, and then that sort of, we can put a pin in that date and those events as setting the stage for uh, what you sort of call the, the evolution of the Fujiwara effect or Fujiwara effect that we're now sort of, um, you know, starting to see culminate. So maybe what led to um, the abandonment of Bretton Woods and then what happened once we left the gold standard and we entered a fiat currency domain. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, I, I describe it as Fujiwara effect, as you correctly said, which is two hurricanes merging and reinforcing each other. And one hurricane is clearly technology and information age. Uh, that's a human spirit. Um, and human spirit is always inventive, whether we're in the caves or first industrial revolutions of today. But the speed with which uh, technology propagates very much depends on the cost of capital. The lower the cost of capital, the faster it propagates. It's a bit like pouring kerosene on a bonfire. It just goes very, very quickly. <clears throat> and so we're living in a world where those two hurricanes, which is technology and financializations, have merged. Uh, and they reinforce each other. Now, if you think of the key dates, 1971-73, which is getting off the gold standard. Uh, then you look at Paul Walker uh, coming in at the Federal Reserve, which is late 70s, uh, early 80s. And then you have Alan Greenspan in 1987, basically inaugurating uh, what has become as a put option, uh, that asset prices have become so critical to economic outcomes that you could no longer tolerate uh, volatility of asset prices. So what led us into that world? The answer, as Adam said, is declining productivity, in my view. So in other words, productivity started to taper off. As a productivity tapers off, we have a choice. Do we accept a lower standard of living and low wealth uh, corresponding to the productivity that we generate? Uh, or do we somehow disregard it and insist on a continuing growth irrespective of the consequences and on a continuing wealth creation irrespective of the consequences. And in late 70s through 80s, decision was made that we need to grow no matter what. 
And so the only way we can do it is by basically bringing future consumption to the present by leveraging asset prices uh, as an additional sort of value creation beyond the productivity that you generate. Now, initially, that's actually quite good uh, because what you actually get this extra fill up, extra growth. Um, initially, the relationship between asset prices and underlying economies are not as clear cut. Um, but then the longer you go, the more you need to generate capital and liquidity that underlying economies require. Because essentially, you need to not just underwrite this year GDP, but next year GDP as well. And the only way you can do it is by levitating asset prices higher and higher. And the further down the road you go, the more money you print or generate, that money doesn't go into real economy. It goes into assets. That's why it doesn't generate inflation. Um, and so the more you do this, uh, the more uh, you're reliant on assets for pretty much all decisions. So if household wants to decide whether to spend or to save, corporates want to decide on CEO compensation or share buybacks or investment, you just become committed to asset prices. And the further down the line you go, the less volatility you can tolerate. Eventually, if you don't change economic policies, the only appropriate level of volatility is zero. There is no volatility that you can accept at all. And so part of the process is declining velocity of money. Uh, that velocity of money just keeps falling. So marginal incremental impact of everything you do uh, get smaller and smaller. Uh, and, so, and so the result is technology information age is being accelerated because of cost of capital and neutral rates have to continue to fall. And the reason they continue to fall, because marginal impact of every dollar getting less and less and less uh, as, you, as, as you progress. And the lower your cost of capital, the faster you disrupt uh, the economy. Not only are you keeping zombie alive, um, it's debatable, and there are various numbers you can compute, whether it's 12 or 15 or 20 percent of corporates, even at the low level of interest rates, cannot pay interest costs for at least three years. Um, and as I said, in most countries, it's 10 to 20 percent today. If you go back 20 years ago, those numbers would have been somewhere closer to 5 percent. Whether you're creating excess capacity, whether you're keeping zombies alive, whether you're disrupting existing business models, uh, all of that just becomes so much more accelerated. Uh, and so, the question is, and the question is really, uh, how can you break that loop uh, as you go forward? Sorry. So just to be, I, I want to clear up one point. Are you saying that the low cost of capital leads to a higher level of creative destruction and therefore innovation? Correct. And and vice versa. Correct. Because because <clears throat> there are two types of innovation. There is inventiveness and innovation. Inventiveness generally created by public sector. Uh, private sector doesn't do inventiveness because inventiveness is just too uncertain. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. You can't just commit resources to that. Uh, and so there was a pool of inventiveness that was created through 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, even into 80s. That pool actually is getting depleted. That's part of the reason everybody is discussing now that we need to invest more in the basic R&D and fundamental R&D than what we've been doing for the last three decades. But innovation is what the corporate sector does, what the private sector does. They're basically taking whatever was proven to be right in science, and then what they're doing, they're developing products out of it. And so the lower your cost of capital, the more any idea will be tried. Uh, and so 20 years ago, a company A might have had three or four competitors. Today, they might wake up every day. There will be some other new competitor coming in uh, and trying to pinch part of the business. And so to me, the magic formula is really cost of capital. The lower cost of capital, the more it propagates, the faster it disrupts. And not is to mention- Is that a bad thing? The, huh? Sorry, Richard. Is that a bad thing? This is where- <clears throat> No, it's not. It's not, it's, not, it's not necessarily a bad thing. All I'm saying is that if you think from a societal perspective, people only move at a certain speed. Um, after all, we only have maybe 70, 80 years of our life. After the age of 40, arguably, we can't change anymore. Whatever the answer is, societies only move at a certain speed. Uh, uh, the social norms only move at a certain speed. That's why we have such an explosion of population in Africa uh, that, you know, you can save babies very quickly by giving them drugs or malaria nets. 
but societal norms as to how many children a woman should have changes over decades. You can't just change it overnight. Uh, and so the problem is really that societies are moving at a different speed compared to technology. And because it's moving at different speeds, you have a difference between Ohio and New York or Silicon Valley, between London and Birmingham, uh, between you know Sydney and Brisbane or, or Queensland or whatever. You have those people within the country move at different speeds, and then the countries move at a different speed as well. Think of the uh, uh, First World War. Uh, up until 1870s, um, France was really ahead of Germany. Uh, but then by 1910s, they realized, oh, my God, Germany have chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry. They've got a car industry. We, we, we don't have anything like that. And so countries move at a different speed. And so what it does, it generates tensions within the country and between the countries. And that is a problem. And that's how you want, I think, should think of it. How do you resolve it? How do you slow down the pace of change? And if you don't want to slow down the pace of change, uh, how do you create systems that actually reduces the societal and geopolitical pressures? Yeah, I think that's that's a key point. It's not that, that the acceleration of innovation and invention um, should be curtailed. It's more that the institutions and values and political objectives in societies are unable to move at the same pace. And so there's a disconnection, right? I, I'm, I really like this passage that you, that I, I took out of the book, financialization will aggregate technology induced inequalities until either there is coordinated global action to redirect excess capital to uses that people prioritize or societies will be at risk of total disintegration. Right. Is that yeah, where we so, are now? We are. <clears throat> we are. <clears throat> and so the next sort of 10 to 20 years, it's going to get even worse because if you think of technological waves, um, technology comes in waves. They don't, they don't just go on a straight lines. Uh, if you think of the first wave, it was mostly directed at corporates, uh, PCs, uh, enterprise software. It's kind of the world of uh, IBM, um, you know, Sun Microsystems, uh, those sorts of companies. Now, degree of disruption was actually relatively limited. Uh, but then after 2000, we actually got broadband network, we got smartphones, uh, we've got uh, better software. Uh, and so that was the beginning of the age of Google and, and, and Facebook uh, and Amazon and the rest of it. So suddenly it starts spreading much wider. So editors and a journalist today are not editors and a journalist of 1990s. You know, fund managers or analysts today are not fund managers or analysts uh, of 1990s. Entertainers today are not the same as entertainers in 1990s. But going forward, the next stage, the third stage, it's all about disintermediation of atoms, not just digits. It's about replacement of factories, uh, atrophy of supply and value chains, robotics, automation alternative energy and transportation platforms. Uh, it's all about physical matter, which means in the next 10 to 20 years, what you're going to see, uh, plumbers will find that there are self-healing pump, uh, pipes. So you don't need a plumber. Uh, you will find we'll be able to print a house uh, uh, for a fraction of the price. We don't need the builders. Now, a lot of people say, hey, you know what? Uh, it's okay. It's like a buggy driver become a bus driver. Uh, but the problem is with that is twofold. Number one, the speed, as we've just discussed. Uh, I agree with McKinsey that it's about 3,000 times the impact uh, of industrial revolution. In other words, waterfront is wider and the speed is faster than it used to be. Uh, that's the first problem. The second problem, we don't feel the pain of people who had to go through it. To us, technology is all good, uh, but you were not there when it happened before. You don't know how much people actually suffer uh, through this process. Um, and the third problem is that as you expand it wider and wider, it's not just low skill and middle skills get affected. Eventually, cognitive skills as well, whether you agree or disagree with the timing. But I think the chances are by, eight, by 2040s, uh, maybe 45, uh, even the PhD in physics will feel it. Uh, certainly, computer programs will feel it. They already do. 
uh, I think it's going to get uh, even stronger. So, 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 so to me, uh, you've got all of that accumulating at a faster and faster pace. And the next 10 to 20 years will be worse than the previous 20 years. So what policies should we have in order to keep societies intact? And a lot of people say UBI, which is Universal Basic Income Guarantee, <clears throat> that it's making people lazy. No, no, it isn't. It's just compensating people for their lower degree of utility or marginal utility or marginal value. Sounds funny to say when we're running out of people right now because we have all sorts of disruptions. But, but the reality is uh, marginal utility of everybody is declining. So what it does, it compensates you for it while still keeping economies intact. It also enables over time for people to find what they want to do. <clears throat> Maybe you shouldn't be fund manager. Maybe the only reason you're fund manager because there is no way you can think of making money. But maybe you should be a poet. Uh, maybe you should be doing something else. Uh, and, so, and, so, and so the concept of UBI has to be an integral part of that. Uh, but there are many other ideas, uh, as I said, from common prosperity, if you want to use Chinese term for it, uh, which is anything from affordable housing, education, uh, healthcare, uh, broadband, etc., cetera, uh, to basic R&D, uh, to regulatory changes that would need to occur. Uh, and an important thing to me is also Marshall Plan for least developed countries. We tend to assume that private sector will invest. In a lot of those places, it's not about investment. It's about enlightened donation that you're doing. Because if you don't do it, you will find there will be a billion people on the move. It will be bigger than Genghis Khan uh, back in the 13th century. Uh, if you don't do it, you will find that's going to be a place for another pandemic that potentially could arise. So Belt and Road, right? Where you're talking about Belt and Road. I guess what you're describing are some building blocks that will create the bridge to get us to where you see 20 years from now. The issue is the disruption has begun. It's been going on for some time. The blue collar worker feels it before the white collar worker, but it's happening to all of us as you're describing it. And so I've heard you talk about in the past how these disruptions create the fertile ground for autocracy. And this ties back to what you were talking about in the beginning of the conversation about do we need freedom for prosperity. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about these dislocations. We're seeing, obviously, uh, the rise of strong men across the globe and some of the geopolitical dislocations that are coming from this. We might touch upon uh, the Russian and Ukraine skirmish that it may or may not be uh, about to happen. So maybe talk a little bit about how you see the, the uh, difficulties that might arise as we create this bridge forward. Yeah, <clears throat> what we're basically describing now is a Maslovian disappointment, uh, that people are disappointed. Not necessarily they're worse off, uh, they're just disappointed. They're disappointed that their children are not going to have the same future as they will, as they had in the past. Or they might be disappointed that they're not adding as much value as they were hoping uh, to add when they were younger. Or they're disappointed that their career path doesn't look anything like <clears throat> what they expected their career path to be. Uh, and so whenever you have Maslovian disappointment, people reach out to extremes. Uh, the same happened before, whether it was Stalin, well, Stalin was a bit different, whether it was, you know, Hitler or Mussolini. Uh, one has to remember that U.S. came very, very close to that in 1930s as well. Uh, and, and, so, and so they always reach out to those extreme answers because people, generally speaking, don't really care as much about democracy or non-democracy. I mean, some people do, but... Most people don't. But what they do care about is that they want to feel good. They want to feel that somebody is actually acting on their behalf. And populists are very good at convincing people that I have identified the enemy and I understand your pain and what you go through and I will be working for you. And it's amazing through the ages how many times people actually are convinced that that is the right, that is the right answer. Uh, and so extreme left and extreme right are actually not that much different. Uh, they both uh, amplify the state. Uh, I think uh, Hayek was quite correctly <laughs> highlighting that there is no difference that much between fascism and communism. Both of them are magnifying state. Both are big for the bigness sake. Uh, they both do the same thing. 
Uh, totalitarian so, at the extremes. There, it's the horseshoe theory, right? They're they're both yes. totalitarian at the extremes and heavy government. Correct. There are some differences. For example, extreme right tends to be xenophobic. They tend to be exclusive. They tend to be um, us or them. Uh, they tend to be localized. They also tend to have sort of moral preconditions, whether it's uh, religious preconditions or abortion procreation rights. Uh, extreme left, on the other hand, tends to be more international. Uh, they tend to be less xenophobic. Uh, they tend to be more inclusive. Um, they don't tend to, they, they want to reshape a human being uh, rather than determining what your private matters really ought to be. Uh, and, and, and so th th there are differences. But the key that links them together is that the answer is the state. Uh, the state has got the solutions for you. And that's why a lot of policies that Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders were propagating were not the symbol of what Donald Trump actually wanted to do as well. Uh, and and so, so the question becomes, is it the right answer that the state is the answer? Because China genuinely believes that that to be the case. Uh, as we said, in the last 500 years, that was the wrong answer. But one of the things I describe in my book is that Nikolai Bukharin started uh, a Gosplan, which became a planning agency of Russia. Uh, he also started a uh, new economic policy uh, in Russia in 1920s which basically tried to combine elements of private sector and public sector, but with a public sector dominance and direction. Now, it did not work. Uh, and he got shot, of course. But, uh, but, but the thing is, the same sort of thing was tried by Allende in Chile. Uh, the same sort of thing was tried by many others, by Mao. All of them failed. So one of the things uh, the book asks, um, is a socialist calculation debate that was raging in 1930s, 40s, and 50s, which basically argued that central allocation of capital could be more efficient than Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, is this debate over? Because it has been over since 50s, but uh, is it over? Or are people like Buhari or Allende, for example, were just ahead of their time? They did not have the computational means in order to allocate the capital. Something that Xi Jinping has today in a much better stance than Buharin, who used to have those little files. He was counting you know, nails and galoshes and stuff like that, trying to determine what are the right prices and the right supply. So that could be one area that you could argue that maybe, maybe we are now in a position that central allocation of capital could be better. And after all, private sector can stuff up things very badly and can misallocate capital incredibly badly as well. The other area is inventiveness. Uh, and if you think of inventiveness, uh, in the past, the answer is that if you don't exchange views, if you don't exchange opinions, if you don't build on the shoulders of others, uh, you're finished. Uh, but now, increasingly, artificial intelligence picks up a lot of this. It doesn't have or require the same degree of freedom. Neither does it require the same degree of information interchange what the previous generations required. So can you actually have inventiveness? Because think of China, the greatest innovator of the last 50 or 60 years, but very poor inventor, invented almost nothing, uh, literally almost nothing. Uh, and that is why Donald Trump was so successful in his campaign against Weiwei because China is still draws on intellectual capital of the West. Without it, nothing functions. So can China become inventive in a society of unappealable authority, in a society that doesn't have the same degree of freedom uh, that normally you would associate? Uh, the answer, maybe they can, uh, <clears throat> because as I said, as human input becomes less, uh, maybe you can do it. And, and so that becomes the essence to say, if we can actually allocate capital differently, if we can invent uh, differently, uh, maybe the degree of freedom that we require uh, might, be, uh, might be less. Uh, and I, yeah, go ahead. Can I just clear up one, one thing that I'm missing here is you mentioned how there's a difference between innovation and inventiveness, right? Innovation is the a iterative process by where you grab an, an idea that's brand new and you iterate and make money on it. 
you're talking about the state in the United States or the, the, the construct of the United States allowing for inventiveness and the construct of China not allowing for inventiveness. But you also mentioned that the state is inventive and the private um, uh, world, the private companies are more iterating with that inventive. So is it that the freedom allotted in the United States within the government allows for inventiveness and there is no freedom in the political system in China that, that stymies inventiveness? Is that what you're saying? Like the inventiveness well, comes from central government, but just the capitalist central government of the United States is more inventive? No. <clears throat> well, it's essentially, uh, uh, inventiveness, again, is ability to explore something without necessarily having financial objective at the end of it. Uh, there might be nothing at the end of it at all. You're just asking a question. <laughs> and, and maybe there is no answer to the question you're actually asking. Uh, private sector is not very good at that uh, because it doesn't really conform with the way private sector works uh, with objective, whether it's quarterly reporting or otherwise. I usually say pharmaceutical company found <clears throat> a substance that will help that will help humanity, but will really help their competitor, not themselves. Would they actually develop it? <clears throat> and the answer largely will be no, they won't. Uh, and so and so the it's not necessarily that it's capitalist and not capitalist government. Uh, it's a fact that in the West, you have a recognized institutions of knowledge, institution of research. They are by and large independent. They have their own charters. Uh, and there is a history of allowing scientists just to explore. Uh, that's pretty much what was happening in the U.S. in 50s and 60s, 70s, even into 80s. Now, today, uh, applied science, call innovation applied science, applied science uh, dominate not only in China, but also dominate in the U.S. Because what started to happen, the same idea of return on capital, efficiency, uh, the likes of McKinsey have a lot to, to, to pay for for this. Uh, this idea that the government should be functioning as an efficient enterprise, uh, uh, reviews, uh, constant, uh, you know, publish or perish. <clears throat> Those sorts of ideas uh, have swung uh, everyone towards applied research rather than the basic or fundamental research. That's why U.S. used to spend 2 or 3% of the GDP on applied research. Now it's more like 50 bips. Uh, and even that is doubtful how much it actually is fundamental. So it's not just China is not doing a lot of inventiveness. The West is also not doing a lot. Uh, and so what we need to do is basically resuscitate it. You know, Bell Labs uh, was funded by the government. NASA was funded by the government. <clears throat> a lot of the things were funded by the government. DARPA. DARPA, yeah. DARPA was funded, is funded by the government. <clears throat> and so... It's a, can you switch it back to replenish the pool of inventiveness, the pool of new ideas? Uh, and the answer is that's what we are debating uh, in the West now, how much fundamental research should be, should be, should, should be going Is forward. it that failure costs too much in today's political landscape? There are, <clears throat> there are many things baby boomers like myself uh, have to pay for. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, <clears throat> there is no question that... Uh, a uh, generation of baby boomers brought in an uh, incredible degree of freedom that was not there before, whether it's a freedom to divorce, the freedom to marry anybody I like, the freedom to change job, uh, <clears throat> the freedom to move countries. I moved many countries in my life. So they brought a lot of freedom. Uh, but the consequence of that, it was a freedom of opportunity, not a freedom of outcomes. Uh, and, and, so, and so the result was a desire for success, desire for growth, irrespective of consequences, <clears throat> desire for wealth, irrespect, irrespective of consequences. Uh, <clears throat> that had many, many implications, whether it's environmental degradation, uh, whether it's financialization, uh, whether it's the low neutral rates today, <clears throat> all of that is negative. And the new generation coming up, anybody born, call it after, call it 1980, 85 onwards, the new generation have different views. So one of the interesting things is to look at uh, freshman surveys in the U.S. One of the good things about it, it was exactly the same questions asked all the way to 1965. <clears throat> exactly. And they ask it from the same people uh, who just entering college. 
So the same age, you can't say if they would have aged, they would have changed their view. It was exactly the same people. Uh, and the interesting thing to see how in 1960s and even into 1970s, desire to help society, desire to join Peace Corps, 20% of graduates wanted to join Peace Corps back then, <clears throat> rather than making money, was a primary motivating force. If you think from 80s onwards, one of the things started to happen, enrollment in the business schools and finance schools has gone through the roof. Enrollments in arts, uh, or anything to do with arts, <clears throat> went down. The primary motivation became uh, money and being successful uh, rather than anything else. The interesting thing, since millennials started to go into college, called it early 2000s, it's interesting to see how that survey started to shift. <clears throat> now, the younger people still want money. Don't get me wrong. They understand that money is important. But it's money to achieve certain things. Um, and what they want to achieve is greater society good or environmental, uh, you know, or tackling environmental degradation or something else. If there were Peace Corps really of any substance, they probably would have joined Peace Corps as well. <laughs> uh, and so, so you can see how they're returning back to what people felt uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and so the result is that they will turbocharge political change, which in turn will un enable uh, a lot of economic changes to occur from UBI to, to, to everything else that comes through. You can even calculate for most countries when this sort of rollover is going to happen, uh, <clears throat> because it, it, it's when, when are they going to become plurality? Uh, the, in the U.S., it's a bit hard because unlike Australia, for example, U.S. does not have compulsory voting. <clears throat> so there is a discrepancy quite often between demographics and voting public. Uh, but even there, you would argue that today they're 20, 25 percent of votes, but they already are around 40 percent or so of the demographics. Give it another 10 years, they're bound to be uh, in a majority. Uh, and when they are in the majority, as I said, politics will change. So if you think of this transition, do you have disruption coming up? Yes. Is that disruption going to get stronger? Absolutely. Can we unhook ourselves from financialization? No way. Uh, do we need to change policies? Yes, we do. How quickly can we change policies? Only as quickly as society is willing to, to, to tolerate. Because if you think about it, center is still holding. So you have extreme life, except, but center is still holding. And center doesn't agree with all the things or most of the things we've just discussed. So what you need to do is to see the center weakening and extreme getting stronger. Now, that's a recipe for more dislocation, for more volatility. But at the same time, what it will do, it will usher uh, different policies. So this 10-year period, I guess, will be the period of the greatest volatility. The, the other thing I just very quickly will highlight, not only the structure of labor market is changing, the role of capital is changing too. Uh, and that's why I basically argued in the book, if capital, role of capital and function of capital and the function of labor is changing, it is no longer capitalism. At least not as capitalism as we traditionally think of capitalism. So it's not just labor, uh, uh, capital itself is changing too. I think one thing too that just to sort of tie a bow um, around Rodrigo's question about the role of the private sector versus the public sector in invention versus innovation, um, and then bring that forward to the present and contrast it to the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, and like you say, even into sort of the early 80s. Coming into the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, there was still a very high trust in institutions, right? And certainly in the in the right. earlier decades of that period, um, there was a very um, high trust and belief in the government's ability to effectively allocate resources. Um, and then I think the boomers sort of came along with Reagan and Thatcher and supply side economics. And we and Friedman, and we sort of abandoned this belief that that the government could effectively allocate capital on behalf of the of this of the citizens. And with that lack of faith, then it, there was just a consistent decline in the amount of funding that government was granted in their ability to like fund stuff like DARPA or fund primary research. You know, you, 
You saw NASA sort of fade into the background and all of those major scientific institutions, right? Oh. And I think what's interesting, I hear you say that surveys in the 50s, 60s, 70s were um, observed that people going into college were public service oriented. But I, I think that they were also, they had a high conviction and confidence in the state and the state's institutions and government. I wonder, I think, I agree today, the surveys are, are saying that the, that the millennials have much more of a, a public service orientation. So there's an overlap there with um, where people were thinking in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Would you say though that they have the same impression and confidence in public institutions and government? Because I think I think that that's a necessary condition for them to want to use the government institutions to affect the change that they declare that they want. Totally, totally. <clears throat> if you if you think about it, from call it mid forties until late sixties, there was a great deal of trust in what the government will do. Then there was a period of turbulence from late 60s to call it early 80s, uh, where people didn't really know what to do and how to move, how much to trust, what is the right societal consensus? What should be the role of individual freedom versus societal freedom? People tend to forget that 1950s and bulk of 60s were not liberal era at all. Uh, most people accepted a great deal of restrictions on what they can or they cannot do uh, as a trade-off uh, against the government acting on their behalf, against the gross rates, middle-class creation, uh, creation of suburbs, interstate highways, GI Bill, educational services, and the rest of it. Now, all of that broken apart uh, in late 60s. And from late 60s to early 80s, there was a chaos. Now, people still wanted to believe the government, but there was a chaos. There was no societal consensus. Now, that's a yeah, Nixon, consensus. Vietnam... The, the, that's the right. hippies, that's, Woodstock. That's, yeah, that's right. Those societal consensus emerged in early 80s. And that you're absolutely right. Baby boomers brought on their shoulders Ronald Reagan, Ronald Coase, uh, Margaret Thatcher, Milton Friedman, and the rest of them. And that consensus, which private sector knows the best, uh, public sector is inefficient and should be constrained on what public sector does. Private sector solutions are always superior to anything that public sector does, that consensus was pretty strong all the way through 80s, 90s. <clears throat> One could argue pretty much almost to GFC, <clears throat> which is called it 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. Now, then that consensus disappeared. And so we now had maybe a decade, maybe 12 years of chaos uh, that society does not agree what consensus should be. We probably but does it, did it disappear though? I wanted to, I just want to push back on that because I, my observation of what happened in 07, 08 was that the, um, it's not that there was a shift in a political consensus away from the private sector and towards the public sector, but mm -hmm. rather almost there was an acceleration mm -hmm. of the view that the, that the private sector is the only um, path to take us out of the the turbulence that we observed in 2008 and it's the role of government to subsidize the private sector's ability to yes. to, yes, to, absolutely. to increase pro so no, I, I, I think it's an important distinction absolutely absolutely uh, and that's why it takes years remember that in 1968 richard nixon used to talk about the uh, silent majority right <clears throat> now, clearly in 1968, there was a lot of uh, anxiety in the society. There were very large sections of society that did not agree uh, with what you asked, or for that matter, in other countries. 1968-69 was a fire all over the place, from Paris <clears throat> to London to Germany to Brazil to everywhere. So a very large sections of society, which was a young baby boomers, did not agree with the society as a whole. But Richard Nixon was right that there was still a silent majority that actually agreed that we must continue. And so a lot of Richard Nixon policies continued what LBJ was doing. <laughs> he, he hasn't actually changed 
uh, those policies at all. So think of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford presidency as a bridge uh, from one world to another. And what happened in 07, 08 is that it was such a shock to the system that increasingly millennials uh, were convinced that, look, something needs to change. But the middle ground halt, the middle ground was still dominant. And so you already have seen displeasure in the marketplace. You already seen disappointment starting to spread, but it's not dominant yet. Uh, and that's why I'm saying, I think in the US 2028, 2032 or something like that, probably will be the right time when the new consensus finally will emerge. But right now you have very large sections of the population who do not agree with what you've just described and they don't agree with that consensus, which was with us since the early 1980s. <clears throat> and so in that respect, you're totally right. Uh, we are now on the bridge between A and B. And right now- It's a fork the middle... in the road. Yeah, well, it is. It, it is. <clears throat> but if you assume that younger people will get a, a larger cohort, which they must, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> if you also assume uh, that baby boomers will never change their view, which they arguably will not, uh, but they will become less relevant, uh, then, then you have to say that there will be a shift uh, occurring. And there is nothing to stop that shift. Uh, in a sense, the technological disruption will get more robust. Financialization is unstoppable. Income and wealth inequalities will continue to rise. Uh, there is no answer right now to any of that. Right. But so, did, so I don't... just gonna, if, if so, just to, I want to clear something up. So what you're saying, Adam, is what what has happened is that we have used the government through the through the Federal Reserve, for example, to continue to facilitate private en entities like banks to financialize further the economy. Right? right. And that's the government's role has been. Listen, let's prop up private companies mm -hmm. and give them everything that they need because they are the solution. And what's happening now is you have a, a, a millennial uh, group of individuals that have a conscious and want to do better, financialization is not going to fix their problems, but rather maybe fiscal policies, UBI, correct. and that, that is the bridge that we want to get to correct, that correct. has yet to occur. <clears throat> correct. Uh, so right. what we were doing is trickle down economics. We're basically saying uh, <laughs> what we will do <clears throat> is to create environment that will be conducive for private sector to lead forward and make decisions that we think private sector should be making. Now, the problem with that is that in a country like China, you can do that because there is no independent central bank. There is no commercial banks. <clears throat> there is really no private sector uh, in a conventional sense. So there is a direct line of sight. This is what I want to do. This is how it's going to happen. Now, even in China, it's not easy. Uh, but in the West, we don't have that line of sight. And so all the money that's been created over the last 30, 40 decades basically stayed in the cloud of finance. That's why cloud of finance or capital is now five, 10 times larger than underlying economies. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why they are the tail that wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or should say cloud of finance is a dog and a real economy just a tail. <clears throat> and, and, so, and, so, and, so, and so the result is that money never gone to where people want to see it. Uh, instead of going to Picasso paintings, Ferrari cars, you know, Hampton mansions, uh, you know, Rumors. Miami, whatever, uh, it's gone. It's gone to all sorts of places, uh, and so the that generated higher inequalities. Uh, that generated disinflation rather than inflation because that money never reached the ground uh, to begin with, um, and and so the next step is to say one way of doing it is for the government to commandeer the capital. Basically, we have excess capital, we have more capital than we know what to do with. <clears throat> Instead of letting <clears throat> private sector make those decisions or lack of decisions because they didn't decide, they say, do you really want me to put money into dirty road? Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay with finance. I'll just, I'll just keep it in finance. <clears throat> and so, and, and so what, what the government can do is a commandeer that capital through a variety of carrots and sticks. Um, and, and that's your fusion of fiscal and monetary policy. The problem with the fusion of fiscal and monetary policy, as soon as money reaches the ground, it becomes inflationary and yeah. reflationary at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, and so the question is, how do you balance a system which is based on rolling bubbles, which is essentially what we have, 
Uh, the only way we can keep neutral rates from falling through the floor and the only way we can generate growth is by rolling one bubble into another bubble. So how can we reconcile <clears throat> the system based on rolling bubbles that requires ever declining cost of capital and disinflation essentially into a system which by nature is more reflationary and inflationary? How can we move from here to there uh, without causing massive dislocation? And the answer, it's hard. Um, and, and, but that's the answer. The answer is, uh, and that's where millennials are coming from. That's why if you think of um, uh, Kelton's book, Stephanie Kelton, you know, a lot of people propagating MMT, uh, nobody really listened to them for, for a very, very long time. <clears throat> now it's a bestseller. So what it tells you is that uh, academia is ready or getting ready. Policymakers are getting ready. Society is gradually absorbing uh, some of those ideas, but it takes time. Remember, science progresses one funeral at a time. So you need to have a time before <laughs> curricular changes. You need to have a time before new PhDs are going to come through. Federal Reserve cannot throw away the system they have without putting something in its place. Um, and so, and so, and so you've got, you've got, so, so to, to answer your question, yeah, it's a fusion of fiscal and monetary policies. The problem I think that we, we, we need to address, you were talking about uh, uh, the displeasure in society has not yet peaked. So it's still uh, segregated to minorities. But I, I would argue that the lack of trust is, if not at peak, it, I, I would say it's, it, permeates now a majority of, of, of the population. And obviously this has to do with the information and our, our, our information bubbles and all these things. So I wonder, I think the mistrust in institutions, tying this back to the great financial crisis, I would argue that our trust in institutions is probably close to a low point because we don't trust the government to do the right thing, but we also don't trust uh, uh, capitalism or, or, or private enterprise because in a lot of ways they're perceived to be crony capitalism and, and, and to have this regulatory capture and special interest groups sort of controlling the game and rigging the game, and keeping social mobility from happening, all, all these things. So I wonder, is this the, the, uh, the catalyst for this potential disruption that you fear might happen but you're, you're, you're hoping there are solutions to keep us from, from that brink? Yeah, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. I, I think dissatisfaction is very high. Cohesion of policy is not high. So in other words, everybody is dissatisfied, whether you're in Ohio, whether you're in Chicago, whether you're in Miami, <clears throat> whether you're in New York or LA, everybody is dissatisfied. So don't get me wrong. Dissatisfaction is very high. Lack of trust is very high. Where we don't have cohesion is what is the answer? Uh, so very large portions of society basically says we need a different policies. But then there is a middle which basically says, no, uh, the problem we have is that because we try to change what can be regarded as a pure liberal capitalism, we actually reneged on the basic ideas that would have delivered us a much better future if we just stuck with them <clears throat> rather than changing the policies. So dissatisfaction is, is at the peak. Um, I, I don't think it'll come off. I think dissatisfaction will continue to grow. Uh, trust in institutions of state in most countries is low. Again, it varies country by country, admittedly. Countries with a relatively low income and wealth inequalities tend to have a, a higher level of trust. Uh, Anglo-Saxons, particularly the US, which has a higher inequality, tend to have a much higher level of distrust. Uh, of the system. So it varies. But all countries are reporting pretty much the same trend. The level of distrust is high. Where we are not yet at the point is to say this is the answer. Now, one could debate whether FDR New Deal uh, would have come across uh, or, or would have succeeded if there was no uh, you know, crash of 1930s. Uh, one can debate whether it would have survived if there was no World War II. <clears throat> but the combination of a crash and World War II uh, basically created uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for change. And then society coalesced, and that coalescence lasted more than two decades, all the way from 1945 until <clears throat> late 1960s. Now, if you think of today, um, 
we had uh, financialization, technology, disruption. We have a, a global financial crisis. We have COVID. All of that creates necessary but not yet sufficient condition for societies to coalesce. I, the way I compare, because <clears throat> I was born in Russia, Ukraine, is I compare it to 1905 revolution. Uh, conditions for revolution were there, inequality, starvation, um, you know, terrible kleptocratic systems. They were there, but they were not sufficient. It took World War I to create a real revolution in 1917. <clears throat> and so that's the way I look at us today. We have uh, a lot of necessary conditions, but they're not yet sufficient. Uh, and so what will be sufficient? Well, you know, COVID-24, COVID-26 might do it. I don't know. <clears throat> uh, what else? Uh, geopolitical dislocation yeah. might do it. Um, you, could, you could accelerate the process. <clears throat> Alternatively, you just wait. And as you wait, gradually electorate changes. As electorate changes, politics will change by definition. Today's Democratic and Republican Party will be looking very different uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, 10, 10 years from now. Uh, if in Australia today, sort of Labour Party or Liberal Party would look very different uh, in 10 or 12 years' time. So, so to me, um, that's what it is. Uh, the, uh, the unhappiness is there. Distrust is there. I think it will continue to grow uh, as we progress forward. But we're not ready yet to agree what are the answers. Well, even yeah, if we did, touched... if we were ready to form consensus... Um, I mean, I read through your prescriptions. I found them compelling. The The hiccup, I guess, is it's critical to move capital out of the cloud of finance down to the ground at the real economy level. But we can't do that because we, we don't have sufficient productivity to for, for the real economy to absorb the excess demand that would occur. H how do we solve that problem, right? Because and more no than that, Adam, for industry to 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 invest. I mean, what we've seen over the last, especially over the last decade, is the private sector is not investing in new capacity. Instead, they're recycling capital back into the cloud of finance through buybacks, etc. Buybacks. Right? Yeah. So. So we haven't any sort of incentive for the private sector to invest in the excess production required to absorb the excess demand yes. as we move. You know, so we go to a UBI, which I which which I endorse. That moves money from the cloud of finance into the real economy. You're creating excess excess demand, and you're creating excess demand. At, with the people with the highest marginal propensity to spend. So that's an amplification mechanism on the propensity for inflation. How do right. we get, even if we had consensus, how do we get from here to there? Victor, Harris, just before, Harris, yeah, just ahead, just before you answer, I just wanted to add a point. The, the issue with financialization is the second order effect that is leverage. And so once you start to unwind the system, what yep. it does to collateral and yeah. so it's that it's, it's that idea of Minsky moment. Victor mentioned this maybe an hour ago that you, you can only have low or zero volatility. But once you start to unwind collateral and right. you're bringing down the leverage, you're going to right. accelerate and you're going to have this phase shift into high volatility. And the amount of money that is in the cloud yeah. is going to is going to be reduced to a large extent, and it's not going to be nearly enough what you thought you were bringing down to the real economy. Correct, correct. And, and, and in fact, it will crush. It will absolutely crash real economy uh, very quickly. <clears throat> because one of the charts I like is money supply growth versus uh, nominal GDP. Uh, and the difference between those two lines is really asset prices. This is your house. Uh, this is your 401k. This is your pension. So if you, if you move abruptly, People will discover they have no pension. Their 401k is worth nothing. Uh, their portfolio managers actually haven't made any money. It was just money supply growing faster than nominal GDP. Uh, and as soon as you converge those two lines, uh, your pension is gone. Uh, and, and so that's politically and socially completely and utterly unacceptable. No, but Victor, uh, the so alternative the is also unacceptable, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And so, so the, the question is, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the question is, how do you how do you transit from one to the other? 
Well, the answer is gradually uh, carrots and sticks. So, for example, uh, uh, very soon any company doing share buybacks will be penalized. I'm confident. It's, it's only a matter of years <clears throat> before that's going to happen. Uh, Any time that CEO compensation reaches 300 times, 200 times, whatever, average wage, they're going to get penalized. Uh, and then there will be sticks and carrots, whereby the government encourages and underwrites effectively for private sector to relocate the capital back into the project, still giving a return to private sector, don't get me wrong, it's, <clears throat> but it's going to be carrots and sticks that gradually moves the capital into areas outside IT software. Because if you think of US gross fixed capital formation for private sector, uh, in the last 15 years, uh, 50 to 55% was intangible. <clears throat> now, if you go back to 1970s, that would have been around 10%. <clears throat> so when people say companies don't invest, that's not true. They just invest to replace you. <laughs> they just invest to increase efficiency or reduce your pricing power. Uh, but people want to see roads and bridges and factories, and <clears throat> they want to see capacity coming through. They, they want to see something real. Uh, that's one of the things you can argue about China, that China is trying to disconnect the digital and finance universe from real economy. One of the things Marxists are very big on <clears throat> is what they call fictitious capital versus productive capital. Now, if you think of fictitious capital, that's sort of your superstructure. This is your culture, political institutions, finance. Real capital <clears throat> is a real stuff, it is what you do on the ground. It's products, it's goods, it's whatever. <clears throat> and, so, and so one of the things communists believe are uh, that fictitious capital multiplication have to be kept under control because capital basically have a tendency of multiplying for its own sake. <clears throat> it doesn't actually do anything uh, other than it just multiplies for its own sake. <clears throat> and so one of the things China is trying to do is instead of digital economy and finance economy controlling real economy, try to flip it uh, the other way. Now, that's not an easy task to do, uh, but at least that's one, one of the reasons why Alibaba and, and Craig Down on end uh, that occurred in China. That was, in my view, one of the reasons uh, they're trying to do that. <clears throat> in the West, we can't flip it like that. That's We don't have the tools of society or political system uh, to be able to do. We have to work with private sector. Uh, and so it's a mix of carrots and sticks to underwrite it. People tend to forget that, uh, you know, Fred Trump, uh, Donald Trump father, uh, or Bill Levitt, uh, when they were build, building suburbs all around U.S. in 1950s and 1960s, remember, they were bulldozing the size of Rhode Island every year. <clears throat> when they were doing it, government underwrote all of this. Uh, it, yes, it was done by private sector, but the government uh, underwrote all of it, uh, just like they did underwrite the, uh, the interstate highway system. Uh, the same applies to education uh, through the GI Bill. And so it's it's not that you completely get rid of private sector. I think in the West, that's not a feasible answer and, and probably not a good one either. Uh, but through carrots and sticks, uh, you can actually encourage it. Uh, but to do that, you have to have societal cohesion because we still argue that debt is real. <clears throat> Money is real. None of it is real. It's digits. <clears throat> None of it is real. <clears throat> but we still feel it's a debt that needs to be repaid that we're settling our children and grandchildren with trillions of dollars of debt that needs to be financed. Now, that's an absolute nonsense, <clears throat> but <laughs> most people actually believe it. Uh, now and, you and, sound like Stephanie Kelton. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think it's true. <clears throat> and I think it's true. Uh, now, I, I would be the first one to say, look, if we can go back to 1980s pre-technology, pre-financialization, <clears throat> I will do this. Uh, but the problem is we can't travel back in time. So the only thing we can do is to go forward. Uh, and if we go forward, if we continue with the current policies, as Adam correctly said, it's going to get worse. Uh, interest rates everywhere will be negative. Uh, neutral rate will be deeply negative. Inequalities will continue to rise. Uh, velocity of money will continue to fall. Eventually, societies are going to blow up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you say, okay, how do we shift? Well, people say, just stop doing it. As soon as you stop doing it, the vigor of private sector will just emerge like a superman and everything is going to be fine. 
uh, total nonsense. Uh, private sector will collapse on the spot uh, <clears throat> if you actually try to do this. Uh, and so, and so, and so, the next step becomes: okay, if it has to be public sector, which clearly has to be, in my view, how do you structure it in a way that keeps as much freedom as possible and as much free space as possible, recognizing that we're all going to be less free as we go forward, recognizing it's not going to be a return to the glory days of baby boomers uh, in the freedom we enjoyed, either traveling between countries or migrating or marrying or changing jobs or whatever, recognizing all of that. Uh, how can we keep enough of that freedom? And the answer is slowly and gradually, public sector needs to change. But for them to change, we need to be stop pre being preoccupied with debt, stop being preoccupied with the ideas that public sector investment is automatically inefficient, uh, <clears throat> that get rid of all of that. But even if we do get rid of all of that, uh, it's a very hazardous task, as you correctly highlighted. <clears throat> it's a very, because you are inviting volatility, uh, basically. And if you're inviting volatility, uh, God help you, uh, because, <laughs> because the impact it will have, both on the financial economy and real economy, uh, will be unimaginable. Um, and, and, and so that's, that makes it very, very hard. And therefore, from an investment perspective, Instead of trying to play, you know, value versus gross or thematics or quality or whatever, <clears throat> I just basically look at it and say, okay, which areas have a very strong circular drivers going forward? Uh, and to me, those areas are everything that we need to change. So that's your common prosperity, <laughs> to use Chinese name, or, or maybe we can invent a better name for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's things like replacement uh, and automation uh, and replacement of humans, augmentation of humans, uh, new universe, including entertainment of humans, social geopolitical disruption, uh, new transport uh, platforms, new energy platforms. Uh, <clears throat> and then you say, but it's not all the same. It isn't because clearly second generation digital consumer platforms are sunsetting. Um, that's your Facebooks, that's your uh, Googles, that's all of that. Clearly, they're sunsetting. Uh, but on the other hand, they will continue to be incredibly profitable. Uh, but then there are other things we need. We need a lot of materials to build new age. That's your copper, your nickel, your cobalt, your lithium, your semiconductors. We need capital goods companies to actually to build it. We need new startups to actually operate it. Uh, and, and so, and so, instead of being so hanged up on the ideas of tech, uh, or ideas of growth, or ideas of value, instead of doing that, uh, just get rid of all of that uh, and look at companies that you think, uh, or themes that you think are, are going to are going to drive you. Yeah, we certainly are of the camp of. A decade of higher inflation volatility is what Adam has uh, nicknamed it, right? This this idea of m periods of massive inflation because there's a fiscal spend or excess liquidity. But I, I, you know, I prefer sorry, I prefer to look at it as as a pendulum rather yeah. than because because what happens is that we would have had a period of strong consistent inflation if we had societal consensus, right? Uh, but we do not. That's that's uh, it. And so what we're going to have, we're going to have an inflation spike and boom, disinflation. That's exactly what And then inflation spike and then boom, disinflation again. You know, but I does that help with the with the debt load? Because everybody talks about too much debt in the system. You say we, we got to stop being so hung up on it. But in nominal terms, inflation would help alleviate part of that uh, uh, debt load or the burden of debt to society. So, but, but, we can't, but we can't generate inflation. That's a point. The point is that disinflation is too strong. Uh, you have technology, you have financialization, you have debt, demographics. you have commitment to asset price, you have demographics, you have extreme wealth inequalities. So the background is incredibly disinflationary. Uh, and the only thing that creates inflation is when the government puts a thumb on the scales. <clears throat> and when it does, it spikes. Uh, yeah. But as soon as the government takes a thumb off, uh, disinflation takes control again. Um, until they again, they're going to act. And so my view was, and still is, that, you know, yes, there is a period of inflationary pressures, but we are facing the biggest negative fiscal delta since World War II. 
uh, we're facing the biggest negative uh, monetary delta uh, forever, pretty much. Uh, and 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 so and without cyclical recovery, uh, the chances are disinflation will come back very quickly, probably into early 23. Uh, and that would imply the Federal Reserve, instead of tightening in 23, or other central banks doing the same, might need to turn around. Uh, mm -hmm. Just like they did, if you remember, in August, September 2019, when we had a heart attack in the repo market, uh, yep. the Federal Reserve changed their course six months before COVID uh, even sort of arose anywhere globally. <clears throat> and so, so to me, that's our future. And, and, and that could go on for 10 years. And if that is a future, that's a very volatile, as you correctly said, environment whereby central banks will be struggling to control and corral risk premium uh, across debt and, and, across, and across equities. To yeah, what extent does- It's active management once more, right? <laughs> I, I just think this is a decade where the, those that can navigate that actively will do better than the four basis points SPY allocators. <clears throat> theoretically, the 60, 40. Theoretically, theoretically, the answer is yes. Uh, the only problem is, you know, when I was a young man uh, back in uh, uh, Sydney um, uh, in, in, uh, in the mid 80s, um, you know, we, we, we didn't even knew relative PE, right? EV to EBITDA just come up. Uh, it was just one of those hunky little things that came out of the US uh, uh, and we started using that sort of stuff. <clears throat> there was no consultants by and large. Uh, and uh, money was managed by people because they managed money <clears throat> and the kind of people trust them. So you're absolutely correct. Theoretically, it is the best time for uh, active fund managers, so long as we don't have consultants. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> That's the bridge we need to burn. And, and, <laughs> the, problem is, and, so, and the problem is the way the industry has evolved uh, the ability of fund managers to do their job has declined so dramatically uh, that that even though which should be the best the best of times uh, might not necessarily be so. You're talking about gatekeeping, just yes. to to a large extent. Yeah, probably regulatory 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 uh, constraints, hurdles, and constraints, yes. and, and, and yeah. you know consultant constraints on the portfolio yes. they prefer. That'll slowly have to change as it did. I mean, look, in the, in the knots, it was the, uh, the alt sleeve for most institutions was hedge funds. The alt sleeve today is private credit and private equity. Right. right. Uh, as, by the tail end of the next decade, they'll switch it back up to hedge funds at the wrong possible time, right? Well, so, it could happen. It could happen. Yeah. Victor, I wanted to go back to your point about fiscal being the lever that when governments are willing or able, they'll put they'll they'll, they'll press their thumb down. We're we're probably coming up uh, to midterms in the U.S. where where by all accounts, uh, uh, pre the sitting president is going to be uh, hampered and unable to push a lot of his his uh, policies forward. But then you have on the other side of the world, China and Belt and Road Initiative and ability to spend. I wonder. How much do you think or to what extent do you think China can pick up some of that slack and how um, the amount of money that they're dispersing to Central Asia and even uh, to parts of Eastern Europe, right, that, that entire Belt and Road uh, uh, geography uh, to, to counterbalance the fiscal cliff that you're describing <clears throat> to the West? And what does that do for the geopolitical uh, uh, uh equilibrium that we we seem to be finding ourselves in in, in sort of a, a disequilibrium more and more <clears throat> the interesting thing to me is that not only the west doesn't have sort of consensus what to do uh neither does in many ways china because china is treating and a lot of chinese treat uh belt and road as kind of commercial transaction they even structured <clears throat> as actually commercial transactions uh, that's why so many countries are beholden now to China. Uh, and China actually requires repayment or they take the assets or whatever. So, so, so China developed Belt and Road as a good idea, but they're still approaching it through the lenses of capital asset pricing model. They're still approaching it through lenses of corporate finance uh, rather than regarding it uh, as a, something that will drive productivity on a global basis, something that will <clears throat> occupy factories in China itself, and something that will reduce geopolitical, healthcare, and social pressures. 
Uh, and so what we have seen over the last 18 months or so, China actually been downscaling a lot, <clears throat> Belt and Road, uh, and they're investing less and less. Uh, and so which to me is a mistake. Uh, I viewed Belt and Road uh, as, a, as a sort of thing we should be doing, uh, provided that it's structured properly. Because a lot of the countries in the less developed world are kleptocratic. So if you give them the money, they'll just steal the money and they'll get nothing. Uh, at the very least, when China comes in, at the end of the day, there will be a bridge, there will be a road, there will be a power station, <clears throat> there will be a water treatment plant. Uh, quite often, Chinese will stay behind to operate it, or they send the locals to China to get them trained. So it's actually a much better way of doing it uh, than just dispersing the money <clears throat> to those countries and accepting that maybe half of it will just disappear somewhere, <clears throat> and maybe the other half will be in some form deployed. So I actually felt that that's actually the right way forward. And my idea was that Europe uh, or European Union should combine with China and spend 10, 15% of their GDP uh, <clears throat> on those programs. Because if you think of a billion people coming up through Africa and parts of Middle East, if you don't do it, uh, they're going to be on a move. Uh, America is isolated, as, as Adam correctly said, uh, you know, two oceans, Yes, you have people from Honduras coming up, but it's nothing in the quantity uh, that China and Europe will be seeing uh, <clears throat> if you actually don't do it. Uh, and, and so to me, that would have been the most obvious answer. But China is hesitant uh, and China is reluctant to accept that that is actually the answer. Uh, are they doing it for geopolitical purposes? Yes, they are because they, <clears throat> countries like Russia or China, that they don't have friends. Uh, they either have, uh, they have vassals or they have enemies, but they don't have friends. Uh, and so they all try to build this area. So there is a geopolitics involved, but there is something bigger than that. Uh, and I think Belt and Road uh, could be the type of initiative uh, because think of it as a Marshall Plan. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, isn't it the Marshall bit, Plan? It worked. A little bit the new Marshall Plan, yeah. Yeah, it's less enlightening that because remember when America created Marshall Plan, <clears throat> it was designed to help Japanese or German to help themselves. Yeah, it was not leveraging back into the U.S. It wasn't doing any of that stuff. <clears throat> so it's in a spirit of benevolence. So it was not not so much benevolence. It was trying to stop communism from spreading, and they were yeah, trying absolutely. to keep. <clears throat> Fair absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But there are geopolitical agenda in both cases. Yeah. Uh, but 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 the thing is, but the thing is that. China is sort of reluctant. Looks like they're reluctant. Uh, they, which they, sh which they shouldn't be. Now, what is happening, however, <clears throat> that clearly there is an Anglosphere forming. Uh, there is a Sinosphere forming. Uh, Europe will have to make a decision. I think Europe is too big to be small, too small to be big, kind of like India, <clears throat> in a very similar sort of position. They would need to decide how they. Uh, create their own thing or do something else. But clearly, we increasingly will be residing uh, in blocks, both for trade, uh, for manufacturing, for critical commodities, as well as for movements of people. <clears throat> increasingly, it will be easier within the sphere than outside the sphere. So, so clearly, that is forming. Uh, and, uh, and I think internal cohesion, uh, sort of the, the internal development of China is now very much internal. In other words, sponsoring domestic, whether it's uh, domestic technology, whether it's domestic consumption, <clears throat> linking up with Russia, Central Asia, Turkey, uh, Iran, uh, <clears throat> parts of South Asia, parts of Southeast Asia, parts of Africa. <clears throat> so, so clearly we, we're having blocks. Uh, those blocks do not necessarily mean war. And in fact, they will continue trading. They have to. Anybody who thinks you can decouple is just nonsense. Uh, but just like when something was coming out of Soviet Union to, to France. <clears throat> if it was oil, okay, okay, okay get, get through. Uh, if it was a magazine, uh, you know, French will look, okay, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, um, if it was Life magazine of the US, they'll just wave it through. Okay, <clears throat> you're good to go. <clears throat> so, so are we going to have more restricted information flow? Yes. Are we going to balkanize internet in some form? I think the answer is yes. Are we going to have more restricted transfer of technology and know-how? The answer is yes. Are we going to have more restricted educational opportunities or skilling opportunities? Uh, I think the answer is yes. But if you want to send us bulk chemicals, I think that's going to be fine. 
<clears throat> I don't think that's going to be an issue. Deglobalization. Um, wouldn't that be inflationary just to, to some extent? And won't that push supply chains? Because a lot of people are talking about how the U.S. Is. has now realized that some critical production, uh, including pharmaceuticals, have been uh, uh, offshore to, to China. And now China is this uh, geopolitical foe that they're so unsure of. Now they need to on, re, uh, bring that back onshore, those, those productions back. Won't that transition uh maybe for a brief period, supersede the demographic, technological, and debt burden deflationary forces and, and continue to drive that inflation upwards for, for a time being? It could. It could. Uh, because what you have now is, if you think of 1990s and 2000s, everything was disinflationary. We had digitization. We had globalization. We have financialization. And the state sector played a small role. Uh, now what we have, we have lots of disinflationary stuff, but we also have more aggressive fiscal spending. It's intermittent, but we have more aggressive. Nobody ever is going to practice austerity ever again. Nobody is yeah. going to do another Greece or Portugal yeah. <clears throat> ever again. Okay, so we have that. Uh, then we have deglobalization, uh, which is also on the balance more inflationary uh, than, than disinflationary. Uh, and, so, and so there are aspects that uh, will create a more inflationary climate or will offset it. However, to dismember supply and value chains is next to impossible. The only thing that will dismember it is technology. I think within the next 10, 15 years, factories will disappear or start disappearing. I think supply and value chains will start atrophying. Increasingly, production and consumption will be located pretty much in the same area. And so what's going to happen, and that's a challenge for a lot of emerging markets, that's sort of a king's road for prosperity, which was manufacturing and trade, is atrophying in front of them. Um, and, and, so, and so it's only the big countries will do better, smaller countries will do worse. <clears throat> so to answer your question, yes, I think it could be more inflationary, uh, but within a period of time, it'll go because most of those things will not be required. In the meantime, to dismember supply and value chains is just not not feasible. So it's a sine curve with a downward trend is what you're saying. Yes. Inflation continues to be in an overarching downtrend, but it will have the, the burst that we've been talking about. Okay. Yeah. So, and the way I'll say it, it's like a channel down. But within this channel, we have an amplitude so volatility. up and down, whereas right. previously we were relatively flat. So I just want to understand one thing with regard to productivity, because we talked about how productive we were in the 50s and it went down and went up again. We're, we're right. back at a reduction of all of, of um, uh, productivity. But you mentioned that we might get to three, four, five times that productivity somehow, while we also have a declining and aging population. So how is that going to transition and, and when is that going to happen? <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, the way I, um, David Graber, he had, uh, died recently. He was a professor at L LSE. Uh, he, he wrote a book, Bullshit Jobs, uh, and it was heavily criticized, and his database was criticized. <clears throat> But the basic essence of it is very true. He basically asked uh, white-collar workers across Europe, Netherlands, UK, France, Germany, <clears throat> whether the job they do, they believe is useful or worthwhile. Uh, and what he found, very large percentage were feeling that it's not, it's not really useful, whatever I do. Uh, and, and he called the concept the bullshit jobs. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and so when would the productivity rise is when we stop warehousing people in bullshit occupation. Uh, because what's, what's happening is that technology progressed far enough to reduce marginal utility and marginal value of human contribution, but not far enough to replace it altogether. And so we're sitting in our chairs and every day, our perception of self-worth, our perception of what we do, our marginal utility declines. <clears throat> and we feel unhappy about it, <clears throat> but it is declining. Uh, and so there will be a time when finally you're no longer needed in the chair, <laughs> you can go home. Uh, <clears throat> and so when we stop warehousing people, Uh, that's when it's going to productivity will mushroom. Because the reason it's not mushrooming, because we can't get rid of you yet. <laughs> and now, 
in the areas where uh, people are needed, uh, because today, uh, whether you're a truck driver, whether you're a plumber, whether you're an electrician, <clears throat> none of those things are there yet. This is the third stage of information. The way I look at it, four stages. We've gone through the first two, we're going into the third, and the fourth stage is singularity. That's when you don't differentiate between human and non-human contribution. <clears throat> so as we go into the third stage, <clears throat> plumbers, electricians, construction workers, <clears throat> all of those guys will feel what my managers and journalists and entertainers have felt <clears throat> for the last 15, 20 years. Uh, they're going to feel it. Uh, and, and so they will become, they will embark on exactly the same curve uh, of diminishing importance, diminishing utility. So the jump in productivity, in my view, could be a couple of decades away. Right. Uh, which is quite a long time. And so, so it's just a lower participation in, in the employment pool, right? So we're seeing unemployment being very tight, but there's less and less people willing to be employed. And I wonder whether we're already, we're already seeing that transition, you know, through COVID. I certainly know of people personally, you hear anecdotes that they're just, they're done doing that bullshit job. And they found uh, yeah. my next door neighbor. He decides to start trading um, uh, sports cards and yes. makes a living out of it. And it, it's, yes. he loves it. And he can't yes. wait to get up every day and do this bull, non-bullshit job. I agree. That is paying him like enough. Arguably. Arguably. Right? I agree. But well, for agree. him, it isn't. The, the, the interesting yeah. thing is that uh, TikTok, yeah. YouTubing, yes. all the stuff that my kids are obsessed with <laughs> it is, 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 is incredible. Think back to like the tribal ages. What was, a, what was our utility? We mostly slept and yes. hung around. And then when we were yes. hungry, we would go and hunt for a day. Yes. And then we'd have enough food for three or four days and we'd just hang around and gossip, right? Like well, that's okay. the human race. That's how we're supposed yes. to be. This yeah. idea that we have to work from nine to five and be there all the time <clears throat> doing okay. things to be productive. That shift, I think, is an important one. I think some, in, in, in the disruption, it's always bad, right? I like uh, Seymour Schulich is, is a Canadian billionaire that wrote a book. I remember one of the most important things that got me because I was 20 at the time. He said, nothing is worse than being in your 20s because you're disrupted from university when you knew exactly what you needed to do to do something in your life. And those five years are horrible. Yes. Right? I think this, this te decade may be horrible for a lot of humanity, but I think a lot of humanity is going to find mm -hmm. themselves doing a what other people perceive to be a bullshit job, but the passion of their lives, right? If they can subsist, Agreed. if they can Agreed. subsist. So I Agreed. think that with UBI and, 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 well, and yeah. clicks, you might. Yes. yes, you might be able to. <clears throat> That's the whole idea of UBI. A lot of people say, well, it's an extra spending, it's a in, incremental consumption, but you have to remember, US is spending well over $3 trillion already <clears throat> in various forms. It's just yeah. inefficient how it's done. It's like a carpet plethora of various inconsistent programs. And then there is a massive bureaucracy <clears throat> that actually administers it and polices the entire system. So it's not that you're not spending money, <clears throat> you're already spending money. Uh, you just, you can be doing it a lot better and a lot more efficient. Uh, and that's ultimately going to be the answer. But in the case of, I think US is a little bit ahead of the curve uh, because there are various explanations why US started to depart from other Western countries in labor participation rates. Because if you go back to 2005, six, seven, there was really not that much difference between the US and UK and Germany and Japan and all the other countries. <clears throat> After that, US diverged. Now, to me, that divergence have clearly a couple of answers. Number one, uh, US has a very brutal incarceration system, uh, but it's not clear to me that it's actually become more brutal than it was in the past. Uh, number two, opiate and drug addiction, clearly much greater in the U.S. compared to other countries. But number three is exactly what you discussed, that it's not captured in Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, it's not captured in any of the categories. Uh, and to me, that's probably the best explanation why labor participation rate is, call it 62.5%, while in the U.K. 77%. That... Uh, because if you just return uh, U.S. back to labor participation rate of 07, 08, there is eight, nine million people out there <coughs> that actually- I no idea was that low. Theoretically, theoretically could be- re Now, the argument of retirement, I don't buy. Because in the U.S., top 5% owns almost 70% of the net worth, bottom 60 own absolutely nothing, have access to less than $1,000 in cash, 
There is no consistent social security system. I just don't buy this argument that so many people will just go to Costa Rica, whatever, Honduras, or, or just retire. <clears throat> I don't think that's true. But what does make sense to me is exactly, Rodrigo, what you discussed. <clears throat> and that is, we're not capturing, and the U.S. is probably ahead of the curve. Um, and, and that creates its own economies. Yeah. Uh, how those economies will develop, how they function, how they're priced, uh, <clears throat> how they're regulated eventually in some form, uh, I have no clue, and I don't think anybody does. But but that's your beginning, yeah. But I mean, is this? So are are we arguing that the future of humanity is bread and circuses? <laughs> like that's yeah, that's essentially. obscenely depressing, <laughs> right? Essentially. Right? Like essentially, uh, it's not well, depressing. But, but, Hold on a second. Why is that depressing? No, but, purpose. But, 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 Where does purpose come in? Uh, I'm sorry, but again, going back to the tribal mm -hmm. uh, times, right. purpose. The purpose was not a thing. It was living a good, decent life. You did what you wanted to do and you felt like you needed to do once in a while. For purpose, I see my daughter wanting to do TikTok. She's a great dancer. She's a great singer. And there's a lot of joy in being creative and putting things in TikTok. Like here, the, the creativity that I see in my children that has been garnered from TikTok and YouTube that isn't given in school, like... I don't sit in my school um, uh, parent-teacher reunions and we go through math and we go through English and then we talk about her art. Now she's falling behind in art. Nobody's talking about how fun That's an interesting anecdote. Can you it's generalize not, it? Hold on, I, I'm generalizing to TikTok and YouTube, dude. It's not the people doing <laughs> what these What percentage things, of the population can do this? Or everybody or, or, with or, or, a phone. No, no. Everybody with a phone willing, can find their 10,000 unique uh, followers. <laughs> Dude, Victor, what uh, percentage realistic. of total entertainment revenue accrues to the top 0.1% of entertainers? 60. That's fine, but maybe you don't need that. We yeah, talked about but, this before, uh, but, the but point maybe is, you don't need that much to live through it, right? But the, but the point is, when people say bread and circuses, it sort of have negative connotation to it. <clears throat> but what, what it basically is, go back to Karl Marx, from everyone according to his ability to everyone according to his needs. Uh, <clears throat> and that basically says that we're all competitive creatures. Uh, you know, humans are competitive. We're monkeys. We want to chew the best mm -hmm. leaves. We want to sit on the high branches. <clears throat> we're all competitive. But what is meant by competition is changing. So it doesn't necessarily mean money. It doesn't necessarily mean power. Uh, it could be ticks. I like you. Uh, you know, tick my box or whatever. It could be, uh, it could be um, religion. Uh, it could be sports. Uh, it could be socializing. It could be a variety of things. Uh, and around those things, <laughs> economies will develop because increasingly humans, as they become less relevant, uh, other economic niches are going to evolve. But the problem, and I think Richard was saying it correctly, is that um, it's a longer term time frame. You're looking at really 20, 25 years out. <clears throat> a more interesting question is what's going to happen in the next five or 10? Uh, and in the next five or 10, we have huge numbers of people uh, who will not be able to find <laughs> those niches. Uh, and so social policies and fiscal policies have to be structured, not to stop progression, because you can't stop that, uh, not to even slow down in massive way, uh, but to accommodate it in some Safety form. nets. Society needs multiple and different types of safety nets to keep it from, from unraveling and coming undone because of the uh, it, because it, of this transition. You, you almost need to dis, dismantle the current education system and shift it towards a passion-based <laughs> educational system. I think Andrew Yang, who's big in UBI, and, uh, and he, he, in his book, he matches that UBI dollar in your pocket with a social network program that connects you with your neighborhood mm -hmm. and gives you right. social credits in order to yes. be, because human beings need to, to be happy. They need to be connected, feel like they have yeah. friendships and, and a passion, okay. right? So okay. we just, this industrial um, uh, based educational system that was built to house people in factories now needs to be completely reinvented yes. to this other area and there yes. is no infrastructure currently that's what i'm saying like we're in our 20s as a as a nation or as a yes. globe and it's going to be very yeah. a lot of people are going to be very unhappy yeah. a lot of people have found their passion already but it's probably very small i, 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 I love the point about education and i think we touched upon this when we had jim o'shaughnessy on the fact that we yeah. have pretty much the knowledge, uh, the accumulated knowledge of humanity in our pockets now means we have to stop teaching kids how to memorize stuff 
and, yes. te- and learning how to learn mental models, the idea right. of pivoting and, and having mental flexibility. And that's what needs yeah. to be taught. And so the educational point, I think, is very good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. One of the one of the parts in the book, I basically say that it is quite possible that in 20 years time, Harvard University or Harvard College will be closed for lack of demand. Uh, and it will be overgrown with beautiful palm trees. No, in Boston, you can't have palm trees, but <laughs> anyway, overgrown by something. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and um, yeah, because education is not that. It's creating a human being rather than creating a narrow specialist. But you have to be very, very careful because if you have young children or teenagers, um, if you're wrong by 10 years, they're completely wiped out. <laughs> this is the discussion Adam yeah, and I have been trick. having. That's, that's this the This is the discussion question. that Adam and I have yeah. been having, which is, yeah. he, I think he leans more toward, no, let's stay the course a little bit. Let's do a little bit of that, but I mostly don't want to ruin their lives. Exactly. And I'm like, let's go ahead and see what happens. I and think we'll I think, be happy. I, think, I don't know I think what's going to happen. If a child is just born uh, or is like two or three years old, I think it's absolutely fine. <clears throat> the real problem are uh, children sort of about the age of sort of 10, 12, uh, and all the way to young adults, uh, all the way to call it 25, 30. Uh, one of the things I said in the book that we might need to sacrifice one or two generations. Uh, that might be might be the answer. Mm. And so my my sons are 22 and 24, so they say, well, my father thinks that we will be sacrificed. <laughs> <laughs> but But it's... But it's very difficult to see how you're going to find uh, sort of the right answer. You cannot depart the club uh, before the new club is built <laughs> because you'll end up in the cold wind outside uh, without any shelter. Uh, and, and you'll breed resentment and you're going to breed uh, 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 very bad outcomes for society. Yeah. Unless you're being raised by Rodrigo Gordillo, in which case, this is the goes. individual <laughs> case. Um, yeah, very neat. Well, you know, there's, you know, a lot of these conversations we've had, Victor, always end up in a, in a very somber tone. I think there's a lot of interesting disruption coming. I think there's a lot of interesting things that as a society in maybe much longer time period than most of us want is going to end up in a better spot. Um, anyway, I, I like your work as it gives us a bit of both um, in spite of the disruption that is ahead of us. Of course, as, a, as active asset managers, we're kind of going to welcome a little bit of this for sure. Yep. Okay, sounds good. Well, Victor, thank you, Victor. Thank you so much. This has been just yeah. as yeah. magical as I anticipated. And um, yeah, this was really awesome. grateful for you coming on and sharing. And generous with your time. We're uh, My God, north yeah. of two hours. Yeah. So, so this was just too good, longer, Victor. But it was exceeded expectations. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting and look forward to coming back at some stage. Yes, us too. Okay. Most investors feel comfortable with their domestic equity and bond portfolios because they tend to thrive during periods of economic growth and low inflation. And we don't blame you. It's been a great ride. But it's a big world out there full of opportunities you may be ignoring. Sadly, we live in a world dominated by a fear of missing out, or FOMO. And in the last 10 years, U.S. equities and bonds have outperformed and generated massive amounts of FOMO. This hasn't always been the case. In the mid-2000s, the best performing markets were international equities, especially emerging markets, golden commodities. So what happens if growth collapses and inflation becomes the new norm? Or what if the US dollar collapses and US assets are no longer attractive? What will the new FOMO markets be? And will your portfolio keep up or be left behind? Enter Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund, ticker RDMIX a strategy that is designed to thrive across different markets and economic regimes. Unlike most traditional strategies that keep allocation static and let volatility happen, adaptive asset allocation applies a proprietary systematic process designed to dynamically transition toward thriving asset classes and eliminate those that are not, all the while aiming for consistent volatility and stable returns. There's almost always a bull market somewhere in the world. Don't let yesterday's FOMO get in the way of tomorrow's opportunities. Instead, let adaptive asset allocation help you fill in your domestic portfolio gaps. To learn more, visit rationalmf.com and check out the Rational Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation Fund.